It's a, it's a great pleasure to, um, to welcome tonight Professor Geraint Lewis. Um, Geraint is Professor of Astrophysics and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow, Sydney Institute for Astronomy. He's also an Associate Head for Research in the School of Physics at Sydney University. Geraint will discuss the secret lives of galaxies. The Milky Way is a cannibal. The universe is filled with a rich structure, planets, stars, and galaxies. But where did all of this structure come from? In this talk, Grant will t take a look at the evolution of structure in the universe from its birth in the Big Bang to now, seeing how galaxies have grown over time and showing how our own Milky Way is a voracious cannibal. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Grant. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you for inviting me here tonight. Um, so I'm a cosmologist by trade. I, I study the universe. I study how the universe evolves. And one of the key things I like to understand is where did all the structure we see in the universe come from? Okay, so what I'm going to do tonight is give you a very quick overview on where we are with understanding the universe and where we think our big current problems are. So the starting point is to basically know our enemy. What is it we're actually going to be talking about? And it's these objects called galaxies. Now, we live in a galaxy. Our sun is just one in a roughly 400 billion stars that live together in this patch of the universe. And rather embarrassingly, we you know in the last 40 odd years, right, the furthest we've been is to the moon, which is next to nothing. If we could step outside our own galaxy and look back, we'd see a picture of something like this. So this is, as I said, roughly 400 billion stars. Our Milky Way galaxy is a spiral galaxy, so we see it's got a very beautiful spiral disk, and it's quite immense, okay? It's 100,000 light years across, and it's you know, a very large object in the, in the local universe. And in fact, we have one other large galaxy nearby us, Andromeda, which is this, a, this is a picture of, which is a, almost a mirror image of our own Milky Way galaxy. Galaxies are very interesting things because they harbor basically all of the stars, and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So our Milky Way is considered a relatively large galaxy, but there are other kinds of galaxies in the universe. So if we take a look at the extremes, uh, on this side we have what's known as a giant elliptical galaxy. So again, it's just stars living together in the universe, and the largest of these galaxies can have over a trillion stars living together. But on the other end of the spectrum, and this isn't on the same scale, we have lots and lots of these tiny little guys called dwarf galaxies. So just like elephants and mice, right, we know there are a few elephants in the world and there's lots and lots of mice, galaxies are very similar. So these big guys, the, the giant elliptical galaxies, they're very rare, but dwarf galaxies are very, very common. And the typical galaxy in the universe, if you had to pick a galaxy at random, would be a dwarf galaxy with only a million or a few tens of millions or possibly a billion stars. So these are piddling things, astronomically speaking. So we can see that in our local universe, we have galaxies, but when we look out deeper into space, there is a whole range of galaxies from large to small. Most of them are very, very small. One of the things that's kind of interesting is that if you look just in our own patch of the universe, something called the local group, as I mentioned, we have our own Milky Way galaxy, which is big. Two million light years away, we have the Andromeda galaxy, which is thought to be slightly larger. But if we could make a 3D map of our local group, we see that it's actually kind of busy. And I apologize for the busyness of this picture, but it's, um, this is because our universe is three-dimensional and galaxies are spread out in three dimensions. And so to try and show where everything is, you've got to have that additional component of height as well as uh, distance in two directions. But this is the key thing that we have. So, this spot in the middle here, this is our Milky Way galaxies, that, that black dot. Andromeda, which is the nearest large galaxy to our own, is this other black dot up here. And all of the other dots that you can see are dwarf galaxies, okay? So our local group of galaxies has two large galaxies and then roughly 100 dwarf galaxies living, uh, just moving around as well. And what's kind of interesting is that the dwarf galaxies aren't just randomly scattered about. But you know that there's those fish that like to stay close to sharks, right? Our dwarf galaxies like to stay close to the large galaxies. So this is the Milky Way galaxy, and we have all of these galaxies 
living near us. And some of them you can actually see with the naked eye, of course. LMC is large Magellanic cloud, SMC is small Magellanic cloud, which, of course, if we try to look at for these in a Sydney street, you're not going to see them. But if you can get somewhere dark, you can actually see these galaxies with your naked eye. But there are roughly 30 galaxies in the nearby proximity of our own Milky Way. The other thing that happens is that Andromeda is no different. It's got its own group of galaxies, and it too has around 30 or 40 little dwarf galaxies inhabiting the universe with it. And as a scientist, we want to know why, right? Where did this come from? Was the universe you know, basically just born this way, or did this structure arise? So that's one of the key things that we want to find out. We have clues, though, by looking not just at our own local patch of the universe, but looking at the universe in general. Now, as I mentioned here, this is called the local group. And as you can probably imagine, as well as the local group, there are other groups. And in fact, the majority of galaxies in the universe find themselves living in groups. Galaxies don't like to be alone. So wherever you find one, you tend to find others, and they tend to have friends. But sometimes it gets a little bit crazy, and you, instead of here where you've got two large galaxies and about 100 small galaxies, things can become quite extreme. You can end up with thousands of galaxies living together. And these are what's known as the galaxy clusters. Okay, so what we've got in this picture, the orange, these are all galaxies living together. So our, our own Milky Way galaxy would be probably something about this size here. But as you can see, there's a lot more galaxies here, including these very large ones. This is one of those giant elliptical galaxies with a trillion stars. There's another large galaxy here. But in fact, there's thousands and thousands of galaxies inhabiting a relatively small volume of space. And in fact, these guys are, are quite incredible because we know that they have an awful lot of mass caught up in them. Okay, So if you talk about what the most massive thing is in the universe, it's a galaxy cluster. Right? So all those galaxies, plus all their associated dark matter, all that material we can't see, all live together in this region of the universe. How do we know that? Well, because the gravity is strong enough to bend the light that passes these massive objects. Okay? So I don't know how good your eyes are, but as I said, the orange guys here, they're the galaxies. But if you look very carefully, you can see lots of streaks. Okay? Do, 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 all of those? All of those are not there. They're mirages. Okay? They're images of more, much more distant um, sources that have been stretched and magnified by the action of gravity in these uh, clusters. So we can actually weigh how much mass is there by working out um, essentially how much these images have been magnified. Okay? And we could, as I said, we can work out that a lot of mass is in the universe is locked up in these clusters. So we know that we have galaxies, galaxies live together, you have groups of galaxies, and then you have clusters of galaxies. And again, being a scientist, the question I want to know is, are these things just randomly scattered through space, right? If I just go out there, do I just encounter a galaxy cluster here and a galaxy group there? And the answer is no, right? The universe isn't randomly scattered. And we, we know this because what we've gone and done is we've gone out with our telescopes and we've measured the distances to hundreds of thousands of individual galaxies. And when you plot their distances up, you can see what kind of structure they have. And in fact, one of the best surveys that was done was using this beast. This is the two degree field instrument. I mean, scientists aren't very good at naming instruments and giving them really sexy names, so it's 2DF. And this is located on the 3.9 meter Anglo-Australian telescope at Coonabarabran. And this telescope, which is 40 this year, is still doing cutting edge research, okay, on a shoestring. And literally on a shoestring, if you went and had a look at this, maybe it's not shoestring, but it is definitely shoestring from the local IGA, right? It's string to hold the, the robot together that does a lot of the work here. So what this picture shows you is in the middle here, this is Coonabarabran, the center of the universe. This is then looking out into the universe and plotting an individual point for each of the galaxies that they looked at. So there's two pizza slices, one look in one direction, one look in the other direction, okay? And then they've gone and color coded the distributions based on density. So blue is less dense, uh, green is higher density, and red is the hi highest density. And if you just had your galaxies and you thought that they'd be scattered at random, these should pictures should look pretty uniform. 
but they don't. What you can see is that there's a spongy structure to the universe. And what we've got are big holes, okay, which astronomers call voids because we can't think of anything more exciting to call them. And then you have these red regions, which are clusters and superclusters, which are clusters of clusters, right? And then in between, we have this other structure, which are known as the filaments, which join the cluster, clusters together. So the universe contains a lot of structure on all scales, from dwarf galaxies up to, and the scales here, right? This is now two billion light years. This is a fair old chunk of the universe that we're looking at. So the universe has structure to it, a lot of rich structure and a lot of scales. And the question is why? Because we've known for, you know, it's rapidly approaching 100 years that the universe is finite in time and it was born at some point in the past. And of course, this event is known as the Big Bang. And we can use the laws of uh, physics to understand what the conditions in the universe were like back then. But one of the things that we know is that the universe was hot and dense and pretty featureless, okay? So you had this hot, dense gas that was in the initial parts of the universe and then the universe has cooled down and somehow today we have planets, people, stars, dwarf galaxies, big galaxies, clusters, et cetera, et cetera. So where did all the structure come from in this effectively featureless soup that was in the early part of the universe? So this is one of the areas I've worked in for the last few years. And, and there's, a, there's one dirty secret, not about galaxies, but about research. I think a lot of people don't appreciate. And I know my students don't appreciate it when they come to start their degree at uh, university. I guess there's still a lot of feeling that scientists, like you know, somebody who studies cosmology, is either sitting at a telescope or is sitting there with a paper and pen trying to solve some very, very different, difficult equations. And the secret is really that we're all very, very lazy. Right? And we don't like doing maths as much as the next person. And what we like to do is we like to take our mathematics and we give it to somebody else to solve, somebody who's a lot quicker than us that's solving mathematical equations. <laughs> We do use postgrad students for the intermediate step. <laughs> I, 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 told, I, I, was, I was at a dark matter conference just last week and I made a, a slight joke about getting postgrad students to do work a bit like slaves and it went down like an absolute lead balloon because there were so many postgrad students in the room. <laughs> but other than that, yes, we use postgrad students for the intermediate step and they are very smart. This is, I'm, I'm trivializing slightly what we do, but effectively what has happened in the last, you know, 30, 40 years is that Science has moved on to computers, right, in a big way. When we have a system that we want to try and understand, be it, you know, how mass moves in the universe, or how does air flow over the wing of an aeroplane, or just what kind of particles is a large hadron collider going to see, what we do is we take our mathematics, which we can't solve analytically, we give it to a computer, and we ask the computer to solve it numerically. A computer can numerically integrate equations uh, and equations, that, with, as humans, we know that there are no analytic solutions. You can't write down a mathematical equation for the solution. And so an awful lot of science is done via simulations using some of the biggest computers in the world. Now, again, I said this, this freaks people out, and they often worry about, you know, is this legitimate for you to do this? Well, anyone who's flown on an Airbus 380, right? That, an Airbus 380 flew for millions and millions and millions of hours on a computer before they made the first part, right? We know how the laws of physics work. If you trust them, and we trust we haven't written a bug into our equations, then you know, we get a realistic representation of what's going on in the world around us and also in the universe on our computer. And one of the first things that astronomers wanted to do once they had access to computers, and this was way back in the 70s and 80s when computers were, were slow things, is can we build a model of the evolving universe? Because the evolving universe is actually simple, right? For the majority of what we want to understand, there's two things going on. The universe is expanding and gravity is pulling. So if we can take a model of our universe as we knew it at just after the Big Bang, put it in a computer, have those really difficult equations, get the computer to solve it, then maybe we can just see how we'd expect the mass in the universe to evolve. So what I'm going to show you on the next slide is the results of one of these simulations. And again, people sort of give you a strange look when you say simulation, right? 
but it's a synthetic universe. We build synthetic universes. In fact, my students build synthetic universes before breakfast often, right? It's, it's just what we do. What we've got is a chunk of the universe, the universe as it was in the early days when we know what the matter looked like. We're going to hit the button and let it go. And where you see the, 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 the brighter colors, that means the density is higher, OK? So it's going to evolve quite quickly, because the universe evolved quickly at the start. And then it's going to settle down a little bit. So I'll stand back here, because I've seen this one before. So this is the evolution of matter in the universe, OK, as the universe expands. And you can already see that what happens is that matter is flowing around. So expansion is pulling matter apart. Gravity is pulling matter together. But it's not smoothly pulling things together. Things fall into chunks. Chunks rapidly form, and chunks join together to give you bigger chunks. And so this evolution that we've got here is evolving an object that should look like our Milky Way galaxy today. Now, it doesn't look like the spiral galaxy that you're used to looking at because this simulation focused only on the dark matter, the matter we can't see, that dominant component to the universe. To add the gas and the stars, we can do that. We just need bigger and better supercomputers, OK? So we can see that sort of structure naturally arises in the universe, OK? Once you set this evolution in process with this battle between expansion and gravity pulling on things. And in fact, if we take a chunk of the universe, a relatively large chunk, and ask what does the final distribution of matter look like, you get a picture of something like this. Okay? So this is a, a, an enormous box. This is you know, several hundred million light years on a side. Okay? Our Milky Way galaxy would be a dot, something like one of those over there. What the rest of the things you see here is the resultant structure in the universe. And what you can see has happened is the universe has formed this natural foamy-like structure. We have big holes, the voids, okay? And we know that our Milky Way galaxy is just on the edge of a really big void. There's one region we look out into and there's no galaxies. But we also get clusters and filaments and all of the other structure. So we're quite confident that we can follow the evolution of galaxies over cosmic time, and they form naturally out of the matter distribution. But how do they form? What's the process underway by which a galaxy grows over time? Now, I'm going to run a zoom in here on another little movie. Oh, here we go. And this is following, there's a little guy here in a box. So this is something like the size of the Milky Way. And we have this guy, and this is just a zoom in. And it's not 100% clear, but as this guy comes in, every time it gets close, What's happening is that it's getting close to the big galaxy, and the gravitational pull of the big galaxy starts to pull stars off the little galaxy. And every time it falls in and gets close, more and more stars get ripped off. Okay? So you're, you tend to start off with one galaxy which is just a little bit bigger than the others. And it decides that, well, it doesn't decide, of course, but it starts to grow because of its, in, its stronger gravitational pull, starts to rip smaller galaxies apart, and their stars and their mass get added to the bigger galaxy, OK? So what that means is that our Milky Way galaxy is, is a cannibal, right? It grew to the size that it did by eating smaller systems, OK? So in some sense, it started off by being the local bully, by picking on the smaller guys. And unlike a nice Hollywood film where the bully gets his comeuppance, in this case, the bully won, right? and has continued to consume little dwarf galaxies over its you know, five, six, seven, eight billion year lifespan. Okay? So galaxies grow by being cannibals. Now, the, the important point is that this process hasn't stopped. Okay? The Milky Way is not the finished product. It is a galaxy which is still evolving. And those dwarf galaxies that we see around us today, they're food. They're just waiting to be consumed. OK? Now, some of you may already know a little bit about the Magellanic Clouds, the ones that we can see. Right? They, they look quite nice on the sky. But if we looked at them, if we had eyes that could see ra in radio waves, we can see that those guys are actually being stretched, and their gas is being pulled off by the pull of the Milky Way galaxy. But where's the other debris? Right? If the Milky Way is a cannibal and is eating smaller systems, where's the debris around us? So you know, as you said, we all look up at the night sky. We see stars, OK? There's lots of stars around us. The other thing that we can see quite well is the galactic center. This is the bulge in the middle, and we see all these dust lanes. 
But where's the debris? Where's all the stuff that we say is currently being ripped apart? If this picture is right, we should expect to see debris. And the big problem is, is that dwarf galaxies are faint, right? As I said, only a few million stars. And if you take those guys and you stretch them apart and you stretch them and stretch them, you spread their stars out over the sky, they just become harder and harder and harder to see against all the stars which basically make up the Milky Way. So it wasn't until 1994 that we discovered the first real evidence of something currently being consumed and really being consumed by the Milky Way. And I'm, I'm rather pleased to say two things. One, it was discovered by the same old Anglo-Australian telescope, and two, it was discovered by a good friend of mine. And so here's the, said, here's the galactic center, okay? And the project my friend was interested in is how fast a star's move in in the center of the Milky Way galaxy, right? That, that project doesn't earn you any money, industry isn't interested, but we do want to know what's going on in the middle of the galaxy. So he was looking at stars here and trying to find out how fast they were moving. And what he was finding continuously is that there were stars there that weren't supposed to be there. Now, people have been staring at the galactic center, right, for 100,000 years, right, since people were in the southern hemisphere. You can see it on the sky. It's quite, quite, uh, quite apparent. But what he showed was that, so here's your galactic center, is that hidden in plain sight on the sky, there is a dwarf galaxy, okay? And again, astronomers not being very imaginative people, it's in the constellation of Sagittarius, so it's called the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, right? Now, this thing is immense, right? If you could see it on the sky, it'd be like that. It's really big, but it's very, very faint, okay? So unless you really know what you're looking for, you can't pick out the stars. But we do know that it's on the other side of the galactic center to us, about twice the distance away from the middle of the galaxy from what we are. And it's currently moving upwards and it's about to crash through the disk. And it's not the first time it's gone through the disk. We know that it's orbited at least three or four times. And its ragged appearance is the action of the uh, Milky Way's gravity pulling it apart. And in fact, this is what, how we saw it in 1994. But people have gone and investigated the regions this way and that way, looking for stars that have been torn off Sagittarius. So how do we know Sagittarius today? Well, it looks like this. So here's the disk of the Milky Way. There's our sun, not to scale, it's really not that big. But Sagittarius has got this huge, immense tail of stars that completely wrap our galaxy. So it's been around several times, and every time it's gotten close, we've ripped off stars, and those stars have continued to orbit, and we have wrapped around us completely this one giant stream of stars. All of these stars, right, eventually the stream's going to dissipate. All the stars are going to get merged into our own galaxy. And in a few billion years, we will not have known that uh, Sagittarius even existed. It'll be completely dissolved. All of the stars will have joined in the Milky Way. Okay? Now, one of the side things which is kind of interesting is um, we think but not 100% sure, but we think that the sun was born inside the galaxy. Okay, so that's good, you know. It, but its parents were quite possibly immigrants. Right? <laughs> yeah. And we don't have a Nauru that we can send them to. Right? But it's, it's true, right? At some point, the lineage of, of the stars, the material that eventually went in to make up the sun, which makes up you, were possibly born in another galaxy billions and billions of years ago. Okay, so we could all be immigrants to this galaxy at some level. Okay, now I said one of the other key things that people have managed to do in the last few year is, years is survey the sky, right? And it sounds like uh, an easy thing to do, right? The survey just means look and see what you can find. But the big problem was we were to look at large areas, we could only use photographic film, and photographic film doesn't allow you to see deeply. But of course, there's been this. Surge in electronic detectors, right? Mobile phones really help to have little cameras with electronic detectors. And it's, there's been a growth in technology for mobile phones and for digital cameras and for astronomical devices to allow us to de develop electronic detectors to look at larger and larger chunks of sky. I'm just going to show you this picture here. Um, so this is a picture that was obtained with, with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, right? So, Sloan Digital Sky Survey is named after Sloan, Mr. Sloan. 
And this is a, this is a good thing because Mr. Sloan paid money to build a telescope for the Americans to use to survey this guy and said, release the data to everybody. In America, Mr. Keck said, I also would like to give money and build telescopes for America to use. And now there's Mr. Cavley going around the world building Cavley Institutes left, right, and center. There's not one in Australia yet. I just would like to point out that we do not have a Reinhardt telescope or <laughs> Packer Institute, right? Actually, I'll take that back. There are Packer Medical Institutes, so it's not so bad, but there's no astronomical ones. So if you know any of these rich people, okay? Anyway, so this telescope is dedicated to just imaging the sky, okay? So it's just it's been taking snapshot after snapshot after snapshot. And this is an immense patch of the northern sky, okay? Not quite from horizon to horizon, but almost as far. And this is a picture of the stars that we see in the outer regions of our galaxy. So this is away from the disk. So our disk, all our disk stars sit in here. So this is out into the halo. And the thing that jumps out, first of all, is the Sagittarius stream. So this is that debris from Sagittarius, okay? Ripped apart and spread right across the sky. And now we've looked in the south as well we can see that this stream goes right around in the south. So we're completely wrapped by this debris. The other thing you can see here is this really thin stream here, and that's known as the orphan stream. And it's called the orphan stream because we don't know its parents. Oh. <laughs> okay. As somebody said to me, we don't know its dad, and that's not normally an orphan stream. It would be a different kind of stream altogether. But we have the orphan stream, which we think was a small globular cluster, a group of about a million stars, which has been completely di uh, disintegrated. And wrapped around the outskirts of the Milky Way galaxy is the Monoceros ring. This looks like a small galaxy that's fallen in into the disk and has been ripped apart in the disk. And there we have the Hercules Aquila cloud, which is just another big blob of stars, which looks like it's a disrupting system. So we have, in this one picture, we have all of this substructure, plus we have even more, oops, go back one, even more, these dots here are previously undiscovered little dwarf galaxies, okay, that are scattered through our halo. So we can see that if we speak about what's going on in terms of the Milky Way today, we have um, streams from globular clusters, streams from uh, dwarf galaxies, streams actually wrapped up in the disk of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is still a cannibal. It's still consuming stars. Each one of these is bringing between 100 and 100 million star, uh, sorry, 10 and 100 million stars into the Milky Way. So it's growing steadily by consuming these, uh, these guys, okay? So is our Milky Way weird, right? Is our Milky Way bizarre in being a cannibal still? And this is a question we asked ourselves a few years ago because if it is weird, then you can't really learn much about the overall universe from just looking at the Milky Way galaxy. So what we wanted to do was take a look at our nearest neighbor, which was that, that galaxy in Andromeda, and look to see if it too is still a cannibal. It should be eating the small galaxies around it. And to cut to the chase, we had to use a bigger, better telescope and just happened to be in Hawaii, so we had to go to Hawaii now and again. It's like there's downsides to every job, right? <laughs> this is the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope, which is at, on the top of Mauna Kea, right? It is a spectacular place to go. Has anyone actually been there? Yeah. yeah. It's a pretty amazing place to go. It's a very hard place to work, okay? To try and concentrate at 15,000 feet and not fall asleep, because if you fall asleep and your breathing slows down, you, it's happened to me once, you wake up and you find you can't actually inhale anymore, and you, have, you, you, know, you basically almost stop breathing. It's a scary place to work at times, but it's got, because there's so little atmosphere above it, you get fantastic images. So, this is what we got using the Canada France White Telescope with these dedicated um, images that they have there. So, this is Andromeda, the disk of Andromeda, that, that disk that we saw earlier on, okay? Now, just to give you an idea, that is the size of the full moon, okay? If you could see Andromeda with your naked eye, it would be bigger than the full moon. What we've got in color here, these are all the stars that we detected, okay? And you can see that just outside Andromeda, there's all this big smush of stars, and this is, again, a dwarf galaxy that's been ripped apart and has been added to the outer regions. 
and then we get giant streams and chunks and bits and pieces. And in fact, the surroundings of Andromeda are a train wreck, okay? There is just so much debris that it's hard to find anything else there. Wherever you look, you just find debris, okay? So in line with that picture, Andromeda is also a cannibal. And it's not just a cannibal of all these little dwarf galaxies, but there's some bigger galaxies in the environment. These two guys up here, this is, again, fun astronomical names, NGC 147 and 185. I'm sure you'll remember that, yeah? You can see that this guy's got this big S of stars through it. It got too close to Andromeda on its last orbital pass, and it's been pulled apart. It's going out, it's going about to fall back in, and each time it falls back in, it's going to get a whack, and it's going to start falling apart. This guy, this is M33, uh, Triangulum is a, another name for it, and it is a large-ish galaxy. It's only one-tenth the size of these guys rather than a hundredth, and it, too, is showing signs of be tidal disruption. So it, too, has fallen past, and it will become a meal for Andromeda into the future. So last year, I think it was, this, this picture was doing the rounds on the internet. Okay? So this is, somebody said, well, what would Andromeda look like if you had you know, four-meter eyes and you could see the stars? Now, if you've been to the north, you can actually see the bulge of Andromeda if you know where you're looking. And it's one of those things that, you know, if you look at from the side of your eye, you can actually see the center of the galaxy. It's very faint, but you can see it. If you could actually just look at Andromeda and see the disk, then, as I said, it would be larger than the full moon, okay? Which is pretty spectacular. But what happens if you add all of that debris? Well, if you could see that, and you'd need pretty big eyes to see it, our entire sky, essentially in one direction, would be nothing but debris from Andromeda, okay? The thing is huge, and it's tearing apart galaxies, and, right, it's growing. So it's growing over time, okay? So Andromeda is a cannibal. We are a cannibal, right? So this is good. This is good for us as astronomers, because we had this idea about how galaxies have grown over time, and they should still be cannibals, and we look at the Milky Way and Andromeda, and they're cannibals, so our ideas work. And I should say that these ideas, the starting point is just before inflation, right? 10 to the minus 34 seconds after the Big Bang to today, 14 billion years later, that's the line of physics that we follow to get to galaxies today, which makes physicists feel good, right? So, so we have a little woohoo. But the, the, the question is, and the question that I think all people should be asking themselves, especially cosmologists, right, is what keeps us up at night, right? And it's not observing at a telescope, okay? So what keeps cosmologists up at night? So, uh, what, first question, does anybody know who this is? He's English. He's an astronomer, actually, and he was a movie star in the 1940s. No, nobody remembers the great astronomers. Right? So this is a guy called Will Hay. Will Hay, anyone? No? Anyway, no, not William Hartnell. He was in before William Hartnell. Will Hay, I, I just put up here because um, he actually was, he was a, an actor and starred in uh, a, a, several movies, but also he was a well-known astronomer and he had his own telescope in North London and he discovered a famous spot on Saturn and wrote p papers that appear in astronomical journals. So some, some people remember the work that he did other people don't. But anyway, he's somebody thinking about what keeps cosmologists up at night. So does anybody have any guesses of what it might be? Well, I'll just go, I'll go through the ones. When I give a talk to amateur societies, they'll tell me the things that they think keep cosmologists up at night. First thing they talk about is surely dark matter. This notion that the universe is full of stuff that you can't see, right? Surely that keeps you up at night. And the answer is no, right? Dark matter is passe, okay? Why? Well, because we know there is something going on in the universe that's affecting gravity. Either there is dark matter there, which is the simplest hypothesis, or gravity is broken, which is the hard hypothesis, which nobody has fixed yet. So do, people don't worry about dark matter because they know, they know it's an issue and they know, that, um, they know that there will be a solution. They're just not sure what that solution will be. The other one that people suggest is you know, dark energy. Is it dark energy that keeps you up at night? The fact that we've recently discovered in the last you know, 20 years that the universe is accelerating. 
And again, the answer is no. It doesn't keep us up at night. There is something going on in the universe that is causing the expansion to accelerate. We call it dark energy, but what it is, well, we'll figure that out. But we understand the effects of dark energy at some level on the, all the observations that we're doing, right? So wherever we look, we need to account for dark energy. More recently, the, the one that uh, people like to talk about, multiverses, okay? This idea that there are an uncountable number of parallel universes out there, right? And every universe has its own laws of physics, and some you can form life in, and some you can't form life in, et cetera, et cetera. Does this, this keep us up, up at night? No, not really. You can't go there, right? At the moment, we can use it to answer some questions, but it's a useful hypothesis. It doesn't keep us up at night. And actually, the thing that probably keeps most cosmologists up at night is filing their tax returns, because tax forms make no sense whatsoever to anybody trained in mathematics, right? So what is the thing that keeps cosmologists up at night? What, if you go to a cosmology conference, at some point, somebody will raise a topic, and everybody will bury their uh, faces in their hands. So what is it? And the answer is, it's the little guys. It's the dwarf galaxies. Dwarf galaxies are giving us the biggest headache when it comes to understanding the universe. Why? So, here we have two pictures. This is the Milky Way as it's observed, okay? So, the Milky Way, large Magellanic Cloud, small Magellanic Cloud, Sagittarius, Sculptor, Fornax, Carina, lots of dwarf galaxies scattered around. This is what the Milky Way looks like in a synthetic universe, a computer simulation of how we'd expect the universe to evolve and change. And there's the big galaxy in the middle, but surrounding it are all these other dots. And you would predict that every one of these dots should be a dwarf galaxy. So we predict that we should see thousands of dwarf galaxies. And we see 20. So where are the missing dwarf galaxies? Okay, and astronomers have struggled with this for over 15 years, and they've almost convinced themselves that there are two answers, and neither they really like, and they're not sure which one to go with. Okay, so the first one is to do with the fact that this simulation here, as I mentioned, this is the dark matter, right? This is that stuff that controls gravity. What we need to do is add gas and stars. I said we could do that now. So this is a evolution of a universe with star dark matter, gas, and stars. And what you've got here, the colors are the gas lighting up, stars forming, stars exploding, feedback, la da 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 all sorts of complex physical processes. One of the reasons we like dark matter is it's so simple. Gas is really annoying. But you get all these processes and going on. And what you realize is if you've got a little dwarf galaxy in the early universe, and it forms a giant star, right? So the gas collapses and it creates a giant star, and that star explodes. The gravity of that dwarf galaxy can be so weak that it blows all of the gas out of the dwarf galaxy and basically blows away all the stars, right? There's no more stars in it. So people say, well, well, maybe this is the solution, right? Maybe the solution is that they are out there, but you can't see them. Okay, so there's a bunch of people who have said, yep, that's what it is. There are dwarf galaxies out there, but we can't see them because they haven't got any stars in them. Okay? The big problem is, is that, as I said, this physics that goes into the gas here is extremely complicated. And there are some people who think that now we know the answer, i.e. that there are, we don't see dwarf galaxies, that they've twiddled the dials and, you know, such that we don't get to see dwarf galaxies in the simulations anymore. But really, they're not making a prediction. They're making a post-diction to what we should be seeing. Okay? So people are really worried by this, but the alternative is worse. The alternative is you start to play around with the properties of, firstly, either dark matter, and you make it warm dark matter rather than cold dark matter, which warm dark matter means it moves around at reasonably high speeds. And if you do that, you can wipe out the formation of dwarf galaxies. Or you play around with the laws of gravity. And of course, when you want to play around with the laws of gravity, you're taking on Newton and Einstein. So you better be bloody good at what you're doing if you're going to convince anybody that what you've done is right. But there are other problems. Okay? 
over the last few years, people have realized that if you take a look at the dwarf galaxies surrounding the Milky Way, we expect them to be randomly scattered about, but they're not. We actually see them sitting in a very, very well-defined plane. Okay, so you can, also, you can see it here, as this thing rotates around, the Milky Way's in the middle, and these are dwarf galaxies and a few other objects, and you can clearly see that there's a preferred plane. Okay? No cosmological theories as yet predict that we should expect to find dwarf galaxies in a plane. So this is now something that is starting to, start to give cosmologists sleepless nights. The problem is, is that if we go to our neighboring galaxy, Andromeda, and I won't go all the way through this movie because it, it was uh, made by a friend of mine and it takes forever to run. Over the last three years, we've actually managed to work out the three-dimensional distribution of the dwarf galaxies in Andromeda, and we find that more than half of them also sit on a very well-defined plane, okay? Which is completely and utterly unexpected. Nothing you can do with your laws of dark matter allow you to do that. And this is starting to give, uh, as I said, give cosmologists a serious headache. So let me just show you where the dwarfs appear. So this, this is Andromeda again, this is our survey region. These are the dwarf galaxies, and these guys down here, hopefully they'll go red at some point, there they are. I know it doesn't look as spectacular, but they all sit on a very thin, well-defined plane. And in fact, this year we just had a paper published which showed that these kind of distributions don't only occur for the Milky Way and Andromeda, for, for lots of other galaxies as well. So there's something weird going on, not on the large-scale universe which we seem to understand, but on the small-scale universe, okay? It doesn't behave the way we expect. As I mentioned, nobody has a legitimate solution, okay? Nobody knows if you want to, do you want to play with dark matter? Well, you can't produce narrow planes if you just play with dark matter. Is particle physics wrong? Is there something about dark matter that we, we are missing at a fundamental level? If you talk to the particle physicists, this, this really upsets them if you suggest this, but um, it might be a, a direction that we need to, go, to examine. And the one which is, is, which is gaining ground, but is also beating the fiercest resistance, is this notion that we've got gravity wrong at some level, okay? And if we have gravity wrong, then we do have to go back to the drawing board a little bit to how we understand the way the universe evolves, okay? So this, as I said, is, I just wanted to point out, this is where we, we find ourselves at the moment in that we do not know where the small scale structure in the universe is coming from. So I've got just a few more things I wanted to tell you. Now the question earlier on was what's gonna to happen to the future? When you build synthetic universes, you don't have to stop them at today, you can run them into the future. And that's what we do. And what we know is, as I said, the Milky Way is a cannibal. But we inhabit the local patch of the universe with another large galaxy, which is Andromeda. And Andromeda is approaching us at 300 kilometers per second. And if you do the maths very quickly, three billion years, Andromeda will be here, okay? Now, Andromeda is a little dwarf galaxy, so it is gonna take this being torn apart thing lying down. And in fact, there's gonna be an almighty collision between two galaxies of almost equal size. So they'll fall together at thousands of kilometers per second, they'll collide. They go through the collision, and the first thing that happens is that beautiful spiral disk that defines the Milky Way gets completely ripped apart, okay? Now, in four billion years, our sun will be a, an old age pensioner, but it will still be going. It's got about another five billion years worth of life left, and our sun, there's a good chance, 10, 20% chance that our sun will be just completely ejected from the collision and spend its life in intergalactic space wandering around all on its own. The collision hasn't finished though, right? These guys come crashing together, okay? So we'll just see what's going on. Stars start spreading out. And the other thing that's really cool is in the collision, stars don't hit other stars, okay? Stars are small compared to the gaps between stars. So stars go rushing past one another. But our Milky Way galaxy contains not only stars, but also contains gas clouds and gas clouds don't go rushing through gas clouds. When gas clouds hit gas clouds, 
They collide, they collapse, and they form hot new stars. So during this stage of the collision, we know what our Milky Way and Andromeda is going to look like because we can see examples of this in the universe. So this is the uh, Hubble Space Telescope image of um, the antenna galaxies. So this is what it looks like in a raw image. This is now zoomed in. So you can clearly see you've got two things interacting here. And all of those um, little blue stars there that you can see, they're actually giant stars which have been formed in the collision. So our galaxy is going to light up. It's going to look pretty spectacular. It's going to look like a Christmas tree for a little while. But just like uh, uh, James Dean or Kurt Cobain or Amy Winehouse, judging uh, the generations around the room, these stars, they live fast and they die young. All right? So they live for a few million years. They go supernova and bang, they go out. So the collision is going to be quite spectacular. And then it's going to continue. And all the gas is going to be used up, but the, every collision that we're going to have is going to continue until all of the structure that we saw previously has gone. Okay? So we go from having two beautiful spiral galaxies to having one effectively shapeless blob, okay? an elliptical galaxy, which some people like to call them. All right? So some stars get thrown out. This thing will eventually settle down. Once it's settled down, as I mentioned, all the gas that was used up in creating those stars, any other gas that was there has either been blown out or lost, and you're left with an elliptical distribution of stars. And there's nothing else for that distribution of stars to do, okay, but to get older. And in the dim and distant future, when the acceleration of the expansion continues, all of the distant objects we see will all disappear from view. Okay, so all of the distant galaxies will disappear and the night sky will become completely dark except for the stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. And we'll be left with something looking roughly like this, okay? An elliptical galaxy of roughly a trillion stars. And in that galaxy, all that's going to happen is the stars are going to get older, they're going to burn through their nuclear fuel and they'll start to go out. Okay, so this is what we know is going to happen in the dim and distant future. And over probably the next trillion years or so, we'll, even the lightest stars, will, which burn very feebly, will get through, their, um, get through their fuel. And eventually, at some point, the last star is going to go out. And the universe is going to become a very cold, a very dark, and a very empty place. So it'll be a lot like Canberra. <laughs> and I'll finish there. Thank you.